Welcome to Fusion Epi Talk. I'm Katerina, and today we have a very special event, a Fusion Science Masterclass given by David Tsakhaya, uh, who, who will be talking about kinetic models on the Fusion Plasma Edge. He finished uh, his uh, bachelor degree in the Belize State University, and he got a postgraduate in Landau Institute in of theoretical physics in Moscow. Then he obtained his PhD in Tbilisi University. And he has got an extensive experience in plasma modeling, being a senior researcher in Institute of Physics in Tbilisi. And then he had been working for more than 20 years as a senior researcher in the University of Innsbruck. And now he is leading the theory and modeling group in Institute of Plasma Physics in Prague. So without further delay, I give the floor to David Tsakhaya. Thank you, Katarina. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm David Tsakhaya. Uh, before starting uh, my presentation, I want to thank uh, my colleagues for giving this possibility and inviting me, especially thank uh, Katarina for her support. Today we will speak about, I will speak about kinetic uh, effects or kinetic modeling in this uh, fusion relevant plasma H. It's not very well known topic and it's very difficult topic and I want to pay your attention. So what are the main ideas? Uh, what are the main problems and in which direction we are going? As a kind of advertiser, you see the first uh, slide, not my name and affiliation, but uh, distribution function obtained from kinetic simulations. This is electron distribution function, typical one, nothing special, but it's obtained by kinetic uh, model. What important is if you now consider fluid model, fluid model sees just a small part of this distribution function. So everything outside these red uh, lines is not accessible by fluid approximation and all models, majority of models are exactly fluid based. It means that they do not see this part. And the question is how important this part. And I, this today's talk will demonstrate the regions where this part is extremely important and explain why they are important and show examples which tools are used to uh, tackle these problems. On the right hand side, it's one of the direct implications is these problems are, or effects are important because I draw two plots. So we have a parallel heat flux, which is defined like this, in the scrape of layer of compass tokamak, so real discharge. This is simulation from this discharge. And the blue one is a kinetic simulation, very precise one. And the red one is correspond car, corresponds to the fluid model, so-called spitzer harb model of the heat flux. And what you can see that in the, let's say, and here we say the center of the scrape of layer, I will explain what does it mean scrape of layer later. And the air comes to the wall or diverter plate. You can see that there's areas when fluid one overestimates the actual values by order of magnitude. And there are areas, unfortunately, when it's overestimates, or sorry, here yeah, overestimates and here underestimates this value. So it means that question is how important are these uh, over and under estimations. So let me start my presentation my from the title. Oh. Okay. Uh, I draw just a very short uh, content. So I introduce the problem. I will classify kinetic effects and give examples. Sorry for typo here. I describe, and then I describe kinetic modeling tools and give corresponding examples. Let me start with introduction because we have to clarify what, what is plasma H. So what we call plasma H and why it's so important. It's not an easy task because we can use different tools or different notations, different definitions that they are not, none of them is universal. For instance, if you call a plasma layer, which is near to the wall, we don't know what, what is near to the wall means. If you call plasma layer, so plasma edge, a plasma area where wall effects are still important, I want to say that there is no region in the man-made uh, fusion uh, or any plasma when wall effects are not important. So 
all region then is plus mage. If you call region with open field lights, the edge plasmas in magnetic fusion uh, confined in fusion devices like docamax and stellarators, still this is not universal because you have a magnetic mirrors so where all magnetic field is open so it's also not sufficient. This means that even we are already have problem to define what is plasma edge and I want to say that this definition is applicable for given machine for given uh, uh, device and here for when we go see the tokamax and also it's applicable for the stellarators we call scrape of layer the plasma edge. Why it's important I will consider later because we can see the one of the largest machines, actually the largest machine, uh, JET, Joint European Torus, the inner view without plasma and with plasma, and corresponding cross-section of this, which is given here, and it consists different layers of different layers. The first one is a core plasma in the middle, here is the highest temperature, highest density, and these are closed field lines. And then there is a last clothes field line, which is called separatrix. And everything outside this, these green lines, define so called scrape of layer. And scrape of layer comes from the name when particles are kind of scraped off by outer wall due to their rotation in the magnetic field. Actually, it's not the best uh, comparison because they come to the wall not due to scrape of scraping off by actually to the diffusion, but still name is left and we are using this name for this definition. Important to know that this, this very narrow layer and depending on the machines, its volume is just usually less than 1% of the total volume occupied by a machine. The problem is this is very important area. Why it's important? Because first of all, this plasma is very hot. So we already see yeah, that all the uh, lights so are coming exactly from the scrape of light. So this corresponds to this area and something is going in there. So of course inside is also very important processes are going, but this area is very special because first of all, we have to cool plasma before it comes to the so-called diverters because how plasma works. So when it's hot, it goes out due to different mechanisms. And then it follows magnetic field lines and it's going down to the diverters or diverter plates, which are located at the end. So I put it here, so-called diverted uh, uh, equilibrium. The problem is that for the next generation machines, up to 90 or at least 85% of energy, which is coming from the plasma core to the scrape of layer has to be radiated or dissipated exactly in a very thin layer. So for ETA and DEMO is essential, otherwise diverter plates will melt. The second important point is this scrape of layer governs transport and generation of impurities. Impurities are high Z particles or just can be low Z, which are penetrated, they can potentially penetrate in the central plasma and cool it down. So these are very unwanted particles and scrape of layer defines the transport and penetration capability of these particles inside the core plasma. So this is second reason why we have to study transporting the scrape of layer. In the third one, which is not so important for our day machines, but it can be essential for the next generation machines because we have to study transport of the radioactive particles like tritium particles because depending on their energy, on the location where they will be deposited in the outer wall and diverter plates, they can be retained it and there is a, some safety limit how much tritium or any other radioactive material can be retained. And this is third reason why we have to necessarily learn transport in the scrape of layer. Now there are different approaches and the most well-known one is just a fluid and gyrofluid codes based mainly on Braginsky equation or similar equations. So these equations are like this, where if you put for five uh, moment equations of the density, velocity, and temperature, we will have a time derivative of these values. 
They are flux and corresponding sorps and sinks. Big advantage of fluid approach, it is, can treat complex geometry. It's relatively fast, but it has also negative points. First of all, closure is required because some coefficients or some transport parameters are not defined precisely. You have to use some estimation. For instance, for the heat flux, as I already mentioned, you have to use uh, uh, Braginsky's, uh, sorry, for spitzer ham like uh, expression. And if you have a multi three dimensions, in general, you have a kind of tensor which defines your heat flux. This is very important value, especially for tokamaks. And the question is, this is not all times the right expression. And because we have also other parameters like viscosity, which unfortunately not all times work, we have to go to more precise models, which are kinetic or gyrokinetic models or codes. This can be particle in cell, Lasso, Fokker, Planck, and many other type of codes, which are described by given expression. So you have a derivative in time, coordinates, and velocity space of given velocity distribution of particles. You have collision terms, and you have a source or sink terms, sink terms due to interaction with wall. The clear advantage of the approach is that it includes kinetic effects, but uh, unfortunately, it Cannot, it can treat only very simplified geometries and they are very slow. They need up to a few million of uh, processor hours, uh, hours for run and it's a huge number. So one has to ask, ask do we really need this so such simple codes which treat still simplified geometry and they are so expensive in simulation? And the answer is yes, and I want to show why it's important. So let's consider to understand why we want to go to kinetic equations, we have to consider approximations used for fluid model. So this is typical approximation for fluid model. So you assume that distribution function of each particle species consists of Maxwellian, so distribution or something near to Maxwellian and corresponding the deviation from the Maxwellian. And this, this deviation is small. The Fluid equations are defined then or obtained under the number of assumptions. The first assumption considers space scales. So you assume that the special gradients are small. Then you assume that the time gradients are also small, but it's not sufficient. These are well-known assumptions, but this is not sufficient because in reality, if you follow this derivation, which is very frequently neglected, you have to assume that also velocities of particles, or average velocity of particles, oh sorry, should be smaller than thermal velocity. This is additional condition. Comes also additional next condition, which is special for the edge plasmas, because when Braginsky or others derived the expression, the people did not consider interaction with neutrals, interaction with impurity, which have an inelastic processes. So we have to assume that inelastic processes are negligible. And on top of it, you have to assume that uh, distributions are isotropic, so temperature is isotropic. The question is, are these conditions satisfied in diffusion plasma edge? I can say that no, probably not all, all, none of them, but in a strange way, these fluid equations still work. Now, idea is to fix so which one doesn't work. Low. The main idea is that as near distribution velocity distribution function is near to the Maxwellian, as good is fluid approximation. So as far from this distribution, we have more and more kinetic effects. And there, so we have to say, so the good processes which support fluid approach are Maxwellizing processes, and these are Coulomb collisions. And demaxualizing process is opposite. They are trying to make uh, transport more kinetic. And there are a number of demaxualizing processes. So actually one against four, but this one is very strong. We can see later, but uh, depending on the regimes, each of them can, be, can, be, can win and you then you have to treat kinetic effects. So first of all, these are strong gradients. This is well-known effect. So if your gradients, the scalings of gradients is shorter than uh, 
your uh, collision with free pass. So you have no chance to maximize plasma. So you have a, you are losing the fluid the validity of fluid approach. Second is inelastic uh, particle collisions. As I mentioned, if an inelastic collisions, they are uh, disturbing Maxwellian distribution. Then you have finite source effects, which is usually is neglected. And this is people do not pay to this effect uh, attention, but this is essential for the scrape of layer, as you will see later. And finally, what comes is a plasma surface interaction because whenever plasma is coming to the wall, of course, your distribution is not Maxwellian anymore because for, for the particles which are not coming back, you have only half distribution, for instance, they are coming here and absorbed. So distribution, even if it's initially, it was Maxwellian and coming here, you have no particles coming back with Maxwellian distribution. What we do now, it consider each of these effects separately and see how they uh, uh, lead to deviation of uh, distribution from the Maxwellian. So first one is well-known one, it's a strong gradients. And let me say that uh, it's not so easy to fix what is the outcome of uh, short uh, scales? Here you can see the picture which shows distribution function at different distance from the wall or divert the plates. So this is two meters, then 10 centimeters, and they at the end just at the wall, or we call it cheese edge. Um, the red ones, these dashed lines, show corresponding Maxwellian distribution. So fluid mode model thinks that you all times have a Maxwellian distribution and it just cooled down. So from two meters, when it comes to 10 centimeters, it's still Maxwellian, just a narrower one because it's a low temperature. And then it comes even colder one and it's, but it's still Maxwellian. But kinetic model says, no, this is not true. You have not only narrowing of the distribution, but also deviations of deformation from the Maxwellian. And you see that as near you come to the wall, as stronger this deviation. And the question is, is this deviation important? It appears yes. And one can do following. We can try to solve simplified kinetic equation. It was done quite a long time ago and see that these deviations, to fix how important are these deviations mentioned above. So what we do is we consider now distribution function and throw away time dependence sources and consider only one dimensional case and consider only interaction between electrons and ions. We consider just electron part. And this equation is given here. We have mu is a pitch angle. And we try to solve this equation using the common approximation. So the first part, assuming that distribution function is a sum of Maxwellian plus some deviation times mu. It's a common uh, expansion. And one can solve this equation directly, explicitly, which has this following form. And having this expression, we can solve time, uh, temperature, and heat flux of the particles. And they have the following shape, where G, T, and G, Q are the uh, integral of under integral values under integral and plotted here. So they indicate the important part of the velocity, region of velocity, where these values are defined. For instance, you can see that J for temperature is everywhere near zero except this area from one to three, where V is the velocity and VT is the thermal velocity. It means that for temperature, velocities from thermal velocity to three times velocity are important. On the other hand, if you go to heat flux, we see that actually all the velocities till the five times thermal velocity are important. Because if you cut here, we do not get full distribution. We have to cut at least here. So what does it mean? This means that now if you consider collisionality of plasma, collisionality means that how many times particles will collide with other particles to maxualize it, so so-called 90 degree collisions. And we can define is a length of the scrape of layer divided by mean free pass for particles. 
And we know that this scales as a four times scale uh, thermal velocity. This is for average particles. And this is what is used in any expressions. But what we know that we is not sufficient. We know that for, in order to reproduce temperature, we need at least three times thermal velocity. And for, in order to reproduce a heat flux, we need five times thermal velocity. So putting these numbers in this expression, where we substitute inside thermal to three and five times thermal velocities, we end up that collisional, in order to get a properly reproduced temperature by fluid code, you need collisionality at least 80. And then you are reproducing temperature properly. But in order to reproduce heat flux, you need collisionality 600, and there is no tokamak which has this number. So many tokamaks, most of them reproducing temperature properly because collisionality usually is of the order. And even if it's lower a little bit, it's not a big deal, but the collisionality of tokamaks typically of the order of 100 or 200 for next generation machines. So it means it will there will be never enough collisionality to have properly reproduce heat flux in the tokamak or uh, stellarator scrape of layer. So it means that we have no chance to do it, being only in a fluid model, inside the fluid model. So let's consider another approximation, which is another reason why we can have a death uh, maximization is in elastic collisions. So as you remember, this was second reason. And I considered two processes as an example. So electron collides with um, hydrogen molecule and in this uh, dissociation, electron is losing energy, of course, because you need some energy to give to dissociated particles. And another example for ions, and we have a uh, charge exchange collision when Ion is coming, collides with neutrals, and especially if it's the same uh, type of neutral, so if it's deuterium ion and deuterium neutral atom, then it's very high probability that they collide and exchange charge. It means that if usually plasma is hot, deuterium atoms are cold, and due to this exchange, immediately this new ion has a, is much colder than the previous one. So it says a very strong inelastic collision. Let's consider this also, this uh, uh, process. Let's consider the simplest one if the charge exchange. We consider the same uh, um, kinetic equation, but now we throw away dependence on the coordinate, dependence on the uh, uh, electric field and magnetic field, just consider along the field line. We consider sources because there is no particle source. We have same particles out and same number of particles at the end. And if you put now the collision operator like this, which is nothing else, just simplified Boltzmann equation, uh, collision operator, which has this form where Fn defines neutral distribution and Fd plus the ion distribution. We rewrite this expression in the following way which has analytic solution and which is and given here. Analytic solution is drawn here. It has an initial. So initially we define that even if we have initially Maxwellian distributed ions, we have initially Maxwellian distributed neutrals with different temperature, of course, as, as I say, neutrals are colder. But if you consider different times, which is plotted here, we can see that distributions are very fast starting to deviate Maxwellian. So the red one is a time zero, so normalized time zero and distribution, it should be solid plus. So, and then with ongoing time, they are more and more strongly deviate from the distribution. It means that clear indication that whenever you have an elastic collisions, you will have a strong deviation for the Maxwellian. How strong is defined by uh, density of the neutrals or impurity particles and density of plasma because you have also on the other hand also maximizing Coulomb collisions. This was second reason. Now we go to third reason. And the third reason is quite uh, trivial because we, we know that whenever plasma is coming to the wall, it's as a sink. So particles are just absorbed at the wall and very rarely they are coming with the same energy they are usually losing energy. And also this means that you have a energy sink, also particle sink. Now we consider the same, this uh, kinetic equation, 
we now throw away uh, the uh, time dependence, we throw away collisions, we throw away sync in a we treat in a different way. I will, you will get it here and end up with the following expression where we have to take into account this sync is obtained as a boundary condition. So at the end, we do not have particles coming from the wall. Let's consider electrons and ions in independent form. This equation has a also explicit solution. We don't fix, not necessarily, should not be necessarily Maxwell. It can be any function of these parameters multiplied by Heaviside function. And you can see that, of course, this distribution is not Maxwellian because uh, it has a clear Heaviside function distribution. It means that showing that whenever you have a wall, you have already some deviation from the Maxwellian. Let's go to the last reason. If it just uh, plotted uh, the distribution of electrons in this case. So as near you are coming wall, this part is missing. As far you are from the wall, this part is filled out due to Maxwell uh, distributions. And this is very important point. This wall effect is so important that any fluid equations, any gyrokinetic code, so not full kinetic code, needs boundary condition to be formulated somewhere because none of these codes can go inside. At some point, distributions are very, very far from the Maxwellian. And here we have to set up some boundary conditions obtained from different kinetic models. So this is one of the examples when we really need universal kinetic effect, which is called uh, boundary conditions of the shis, which are used by all fluid models. Now let's go to the last case, which I promised. This is an effect of finite size source. This effect is usually neglected, but it's very strong, stronger than frequently stronger than other effects. Why? Because in reality, when people consider volume, I mean, some source of plasma, it's assumed that it has infinite size. So if you put in infinite size system, uh, particles with Maxwell distribution, also your result will be Maxwell distribution. This is not true for finite side source because if you consider a realistic situation, you have usually in a tokamak plasma, you have so-called ballooning type of transport outside. So it means that you have plasma is going roughly just this area. This transport outside is negligible. And in this area, sometimes have opposite uh, flux, but we neglect this uh, case. It just consider linearized this area. We take one of these flux tubes, put as a line, consider these two points and say, okay, we have particle source in the region from A to B, no source in the rest of the region. We can write corresponding this uh, kinetic equation. Also here we can have neglect time, we can neglect uh, velocities. I mean, the uh, electric field, because here we have it's electric field along the field line, it's really small. Consider one dimensional case, assume that source is given as a source of Maxwellian particles with some shape. So from this equation, we come to this kinetic equation with a clear uh, some boundary condition and these points A and B. And this equation has also kinetic uh, explicit solution which is given here and plot it in this picture. So it means that if we are now in the central point, it means central point somewhere here between these two points, we can really have Maxwellian distribution if we even put particles as a Maxwell distribution. But when, so, but when, it, uh, oh, wrong, sorry. This Maxwellian distribution is just for comparison. Even if you put in the center, the blue curve, and we see that we do not have Maxwellian even in the center. So, and even as far we go from the center, deviation from Maxwellian is increases. So these points, these distributions, blue and red corresponds uh, distances from the center. So this is X1 is a center, X2 is a little bit far from the central part of the source. It means that also, even if you do not have some inelastic collisions, even if you do not strong gradients, just because your source is limited in size, 
you already have deviation from Maxwellia. So even if you put Maxwellia plasma in your uh, scrape of Leia, you will never get Maxwellia distribution. It's only Maxwellizing coolant collisions can lead to this distribution. Now we can come to back to our first slide, uh, the picture from the back, first slide and can say, so why we got these deviations? Now help me please, uh, how we have a distribution uh, of the profile of the parallel heat flux. This is true one, there is the exact calculations. And this is a kinetic one. Here we have a central part, so central near to the source. And here we are near to the wall. And we see that in this ERAS, we already discussed, we have finite source effects. That's why it so strongly deviates from the actual one. Also, we have steep gradients. And in this area, they are overestimating of Maxwellian uh, actual flux. On the other hand, we have steep gradients in the end. And in this case, it's, these steep gradients are not sufficient to keep to uh, reproduce the actual heat fluxes. And we have to really understand why it so strongly deviates also here. So why it's underestimated. And this is essentially important because this area defines the heat flux near to the diverter. Now, the question is, we have to try to understand why we get this because we need more physics, it's not sufficient. So we know that we have inelastic collisions, we have steep gradients, but we it's not sufficient. We have to make a more proper simulations. And now I try to describe tools for plasma edge study. So we understand that considering these simple models that we have to uh, study these models, but uh, we have to now describe which tool to use it. So as I say, fluid models are not sufficient to study this. Now we are coming to kinetic tools, but there are also huge, uh, different kinetic tools. The most popular ones are so-called gyrokinetic because they, have, they are two dimensional in velocity space. So what is the advantage of these kinetic tools? They are relatively fast and very fast compared to three dimensional in velocity space tools. They are very popular. It means a lot of people are trying to use, so we have a lot of quotes and they are very well, let's say, uh, optimized. But the problem is, it's not sufficient because first of all, uh, for a strong radial gradients, you do not have, uh, you cannot use gyrokinetic approximation because in many cases, for instance, in ETA demo, the radial gradient length is of, this, uh, of the order of the gyro radius. Many people using this code are saying, okay, is not a big problem. They are checking each time and it seems that it's a not really essential problem. Okay, let's go to the next problem. These codes require boundary conditions at the wall because in order to describe particle absorption at the wall, you need three-dimensional velocity distribution. Okay, one can use some uh, approximations use, as I say, boundary conditions at the sheets. And let's say, okay, these two are maybe not so essential, but let's go to the next one, which is usually not discussed, but it's very important, maybe most important. The problem is, as near you come to the diverter plasma, so near to diverters, in the next generation machines, plasma becomes so dense that it's not magnetized anymore. So here's a plot of this picture showing that if you take a density of the diverter, if you take temperature of the diverter plasma and compare the ion ion collision, Coulomb collision frequency and compare it with this uh, uh, a cyclotron frequency, it has very strong play. I mean, very strong, it has a very strong influence because at this point, ion ion collisions are of the order of gyrokinetic uh, frequency. This means that when particle makes one rotation due to magnetic field, it already collides. This, and this is the basics of gyrokinetic codes. It means that if you want to consider next generation machines, so high density data, or just demo plasma for the high density diverter plasma, 
then you cannot stand this condition. You can you have to use to third dimensional models, and uh, we can go to next step. So choose which three dimensional models we have for plasma study. And uh, let me speed up a little bit because I say I already consumed 30 minutes. Um, there are two models, actually, mainly use two models. These are focal plan codes, which are directly solving kinetic equation. The advantage of these codes, these are full kinetic, you directly operate with particle distribution functions, which is very big advantage. But the problem is dimensionality. This is the main problem. And the second problem is implementation of uh, collision operators, because each type of collision operator, it's integral differential expression and have to be separately implemented in the code. About dimensionality, why it's difficult? Because as I say, we need three dimensional in velocity space. And if you consider two dimensional in user space and three dimensional in velocity space, assume that we have 100 degrees per dimension, we get 10 to 10 elements for velocity distribution function for each space location and for each velocity beam. In this huge number, we cannot attend at least at this moment, at this given power of our day, supercomputers is not, they are not capable to really treat these numbers. On the other hand, we have particle in cell codes, which are just solving particle interaction and you are following each particle and they, are, they don't need greeting of the velocity. And this means that you can treat high dimensional cases. The, they can easily retreat also co collisions because collision operator is universal. You just try, you have two particles colliding and you have to just write a corresponding uh, expressions conserving momentum and energy and it's relatively universal. So you don't need for each collision operator to derive a new uh, expression. The main disadvantage of this approach, they, are, they have numerical fluctuations because it's very, you, you will never get same number of particles in the simulation as in real plasma. And you know that the oscillations and just statistical errors are scaling as one over square root of number of particles. And this is the main, so you need a special care to take these uh, oscillations out of the simulation. Now, I don't know how much time. Ekaterina, do you have five times or should I stop here? Uh, you're welcome to continue. I think we're already, uh, we're all very interested in the topic. So please go on. Okay, I don't know. So um, uh, let me skip this, let me show just one example of just a uh, video of uh, particle in cell simulation because this demonstrates the technique. So we have two particles now. They are put in, in a tilted magnetic field and they interact between each other and also have rotate the magnetic field. So it's impossible to solve analytically, but in the computer it's trivial. So what you have is their position the positions give so-called uh, weight to the density. So these are corresponding density of these particles. And whenever you have density expressed in some uh, value, so you can use the Poisson equation, obtain potential electric field. So whenever you go to many particles, then situation is even much better or much nicer because this was just demonstration for two particles. The problem is whenever we go to full scrape of simulations, scrape of layer simulations, number of particles is 10 to nine, 10 to 10, and it's very difficult to plot the outcome. So what I did, I just made a trick and consider low temperature plasma simulation video from my friend, Konstantin Matthias, which shows now many ion simulation in the realistic uh, laboratory plasma modeling. So this is distribution function, time dependent one. So you have the so-called radio frequency coupled plasma. And you can see that uh, this distribution is changing in time. The densities are changing in time. I saw it why it stopped. Most importantly, oh, it stopped. Most importantly, this shows the radiation. And important was that this radiation reproduced from the distribution from, from the simulation exactly agrees with the experiment 
showing that these uh, models work quite well. Okay, I think I came fast at the end because I wanted to say, okay, we considered very simplified models. We considered reasons. So these reasons were in elastic collisions, the uh, uh, finite source size source uh, effects. These were very strong gradient scale lengths, short score gradient scale lengths. But what is coming now to real simulations, to real machines? Do engineers or designers of new machines care about this? And this is one of the applications that I wanted to also show it, or this, they care because it appears that these effects can be essential. As you remember, let me go just one second back. I think I showed this uh, uh, summarizing uh, plot. Uh, when I show this, I discussed that, okay, we see that the heat flux near to the wall is higher than it predicted by fluid models. Now, if you go back, and now plot more precise and simulation results, you can see that they are not only high, it can be many by factor of 12, so order of magnitude higher than it gives analytic model. So what is plotted here? We consider just electrons, we consider heat load at the diverters due to just electrons. Usually we consider so-called normalized electron heat flux. It means that electron heat flux to the diverter divided by flux, particle flux, the electron particle flux, and divided by electron temperature. And this is called so-called Xi C transmission factor. And it's very good parameter because if you consider simple model, Maxwellian model, you find out that it's just two. So all fluid models are assuming that this number is two. So it's very nice. And if you now consider case, when you have no strong gradient of temperature, so it's a temperature ratio at the outer mid plane, so here to temperature that she said, so here, so as small as small this temperature ratio, so starting from one, this parameter is really classical, so it's two. So now we are increasing this number outer mid plane, and it also increases, so the parameter while according to model, it should stay just two. And as far we increase it gradient, as stronger this effect is. And this was one of the reason when it was demonstrated to ITA, we set up special uh, project to investigate what's happening in next generation machines. Because if this was for existing machine and for ITA, this should not happen because then we will have melting of the ITA tiles. So next generation machine will not operate. Fortunately, I do not plot it here. At some time, when we have very large temperature gradients, plasma becomes so cold here that Maxwellian, uh, so the Coulomb collisions starting to dominate, and then it goes down. The question is how much down it goes, and we are still investigating this. So I had some number of backup flights and uh, explanations why we have these effects, but let me skip this because I think I already did 40 minutes. Thank you very much. So just come to end. Thank you very much for the very interesting and detailed presentation. I'm looking forward for questions. Okay, I see a question from uh, Katerina Hromasova. Go ahead. Hello, David. Thank you for the presentation. I want to ask if the fluid codes have so many limitations, then what do you need to do in order to, you know, get them working? get them into a believable state? Okay, uh, very good question, because as I said at the beginning, in a very strange way, fluid codes work quite well. There is no explanation why. The only doubt is we don't know maybe for next generation machines, they will not work as good as they work for our day machines. The point what is uh, important and one can improve is uh, to introduce a so-called local models of for the heat transport. Because as higher uh, moment you consider, so heat flux is a third moment, temperature is second moment, and so So as I say, for temperature, there is no problem. But if you go to the third moment, problems start, kinetic effects start to operate, so to show up here. So we are working, actually, we know, we discussed already, 
that we try to introduce some model which will improve this model. Actually, these models existed and they were called so-called flux limiting expressions. But about 10 years ago, to my unfortunate, I demonstrated they do not really work because they a little bit improved agreement, but still you have a, so if you use so-called flux limiting expressions of the heat flux, they still do not follow this nice distribution to our unfortunate. There were different models introduced, but none of them are really good because A, they are either too complex, even for simplified cases. Simplified means no interaction of uh, plasma with neutrals and impurity. And B, they are so complex to be introduced in fluid codes that they people gave up. Aim is, and we want to, what to do following, to introduce a model which should be sufficiently easy to treat by fluid codes. On the other hand, it will catch this behavior more or less, so we will have a not so strong uh, heat fluxes given at the upstream soul, and we will have not so strong underestimation of the heat fluxes here. Yeah. There are some hopes we tried, started uh, quite a long time ago, but these are so time consuming that maybe we have a hope to do with this our one dimensional fluid model, which is Jakob is doing now. This is one step forward. So if you get this, you'll have at least improved third moment. And let's see what will be next. So you construct a model within the fluid model to capture the, the, the kinetic effects. Yes. Uh, and you feed this model the, the fluid parameters, the ones that were averaged assuming the Maxwellian distribution like density, temperature and so on. Isn't uh, that kind uh, of like uh, oxymoronic? Uh, that you uh, I calculate? Can show. Yeah, I mean, uh, don't be surprised, please, because this is one of the demonstration. This is a distribution function somewhere that's a near the CSH, but it's similar everywhere in the scrape of layer. It shows that distribution is very well dis uh, described by B Maxwellian, so double Maxwellian distribution. So you have a thermal part of distribution and have a hot non-Maxwellian super thermal particles. And you can really uh, understand and describe then why they appear. And if we find a way to calculate this uh, fraction of super thermal particles, then job is done because if we have fraction, we know their temperature, usually it's upstream, so outer mid plane temperature. So then we can dis, dis, uh, derive our heat flux based on B Maxwellian distribution. And these are one of the examples. So how we can calculate these fluxes. So from fluid profiles, we can hopefully obtain the uh, fraction or concentration of these particles and having there this concentration is sufficient to calculate uh, the distribution function of the heat flux. Because if you can see here, I have no time to explain, we have two cases. The, uh, these uh, circles are showing peak output, but the ROMs are showing analytic calculation, pure analytic calculations. And this means that these analytic calculations are based on the model which I described, nothing else. Simply, it's very difficult to obtain the concentration because it's just a one tenth of percent and you have to be very precise in this calculation. So if we succeed this, we reduce our uh, search just to calculating this uh, super thermal particle uh, uh, I mean concentration. This is one of the possibilities. People were treating other points too, they are called so special non-local models derived. They are also semi-empirical. So you can write a kernel of your distribution. It means that you do not, your distribution, or let's say if your, um, how it is, uh, let me go, to, uh, the spitzer harm is depends not only, this expression is not just a, a differential expression, it is integral differential equation, which takes into account also uh, non-local uh, distribution functions. It's also can be done and it's done simply is not sufficient. It does not reproduce, but this is another way how we can get this distribution. So if we have a, this kernel in the integral, which depends on the 
plasma density and temperature, which can be obtained by fluid model, then it can be also true. This is another model. Thank you very much. I uh, hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see there is uh, Dominic Power uh, who has a question, but he has to go soon. I don't know if you can stay for a moment and ask it or. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, I can stay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, my question was about uh, using PIC simulations to model uh, impurity species. Is this something you can do quite accurately or do you find it quite difficult to resolve the distribution functions when the particle density is quite low? Yeah, I mean, this simulation, for instance, is includes carbon. So because you never get sufficient cooling of uh, plasma at uh, compass if you neglect carbon from the simulation. So uh, in these simulations, they're including. So we have simulations when you have a kind of trace uh, model. Trace model means we, we don't care what is, uh, uh, how impurities are affecting plasma. This is usually happen happening for tungsten impurity because tungsten is not big radiator inside scrape of layer, but where one is interested, what is uh, how tungsten is penetrating the core plasma. In this case, we also use particle in cell model because we have a profiles from the particle in cell and the tungsten ions are uh, moving in this given field. But in this simulation, it's self-consistent. So you can have a um, carbon. Usually when we do, for instance, ETA simulations, we are using neon or jet, also neon. We had also called carbon era when it was, we were using carbon. So to be honest, we do not use uh, very complex models because these are very time consuming. Uh, for instance, for these simulations, we use just the first and second uh, ionized state of carbon. Uh, which already sufficient to reproduce experimental results. So short answer, yes, we can do it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else uh, having a question? Um, I don't see uh, any other raised hands. So I would like to thank you again for the presentation. Uh, this is uh, official end of our webinar, but uh, you are free to stay for a while and uh...